thank you very much for being here, um, and, and thank you to the organizers for this wonderful opportunity um, to talk about a topic that's so, so close to my heart. Um, today I'll be talking to you about marketing biodiversity conservation in the age of learning, but although my title mentions biodiversity conservation, a lot of what I'll be talking about um, actually applies to a lot of um, diver diverse realms within social marketing. So I'll, I want to start this presentation with a story. Um, and this is the story of Abraham Wald. Abraham Wald was a Hungarian mathematician. He was forced to leave his home country um, before the Second World War due to Nazi persecutions and uh, came to the United States. And during the Second World War, he worked for the US government and particularly with uh, the Air Force. One of the challenges that was put, uh, one of the things they wanted to solve was that at that point, the US Air Force was suffering a lot of casualties, losing a lot of planes um, in combat. And they wanted to reinforce them, make them more resistant, more likely to come back from their, from their war uh, battle activities. And so, of course, the problem is that you can't reinforce the whole surface of a plane. If you do that, it will be too heavy, you will lose maneuverability. So you have to choose where you, where you want to reinforce it. So the Air Force had done a lot of data collection. Uh, they had looked at the planes that arrived after battle and mapped the damage. So what you see there in black is where the damage uh, was mapped out, the areas with the most damage. And so they asked Abraham, so should we just reinforce those areas where we see the most damage? Is, is, what, what do you think about that? And he quickly realized that the fact that they were lo just looking at a section of the data, the whole thing, because obviously they couldn't look at the planes that didn't make it back, um, changed things quite dramatically. They were not, that black map you see behind me is not a map of where most damage occurs. It is in fact a map of where a plane can take damage and still make it back. And so because of that, what you should be looking to reinforce are in fact the, dam the areas where you see no damage at all. And so the fact that he had this vision, this ability to see through some of the information and, and, and the data um, meant that, you know, created a big advantage for, for the US military. And the message I'm trying to get out here is that very often we focus on bright spots, on the things that work, and we forget the other section of the data, the dark spots, the things that don't go according to plan. But actually, there's a lot to be said about the value of that information in terms of learning, in terms of improving over time. Now, I am aware of the fact that failure is a difficult word in a lot of contexts, and for a lot of us, uh, we like to project a perfect 10 image of ourselves and the institutions that we work in, and that's understandable. Uh, you know, I, I'm in the same boat, of course. Um, however, what I'm always surprised by is that when you think about the types of issues we work in, uh, when you think about the uncertainty that surrounds them, we think about the complexity of the social change we want to achieve, um, it seems pretty unrealistic um, to uh, look at the, the environment that we you know, traditionally move in and see how much success you see, we talk about and how little failure we actually report back. Um, you know, it seems difficult to believe. And at the same time, if we are that successful all the time, how come we're still dealing with the same issues that we were dealing with 30 years back? So I think there's some reflection to be done, to be done there, um, and particularly learning with other sectors. So if you think about startups, startups, about 40% of them fail within the first year, 90% of them fail within the first decade. Now in that realm of startups, failure is really a common happening. It's not special, it's not different. And the, re the reason I think that in that particular context, people see it fairly different is because they have this realization that yeah, failure is a normal consequence of risk. Whenever you take risk, you open the door to failure. That's one possibility as soon as you take a risk. But it is also critical to think of risk as a necessary precondition to innovation. So if you want to improve, if you want to do something a little bit different, if you feel like we need to push the envelope further a little bit to actually try, try to tackle more effectively some of the issues that we care about, then we need to take risks, and that just means that we'll fail sometimes, and that shouldn't be either a surprise or a problem. Now, all of us work on social change issues that we care deeply about, um, and because we care about them, often we have issues with the fact that we didn't achieve our stated uh, objectives or initially. 
Um, but actually, that should be okay. That should be completely acceptable as long as we turn that outcome that's not exactly as planned and turn it into learning. And so if we really want to, if we see ourselves as social change agents, that we make sure that we're going to push the issues forward, if we really believe that you know, we should have a first do no harm type policy, just like in the same way that doctors do, then it is our actual, actual ethical duty to learn and ensure that whatever outcomes that we don't obtain as we planned, we turn those into learning that can benefit ourselves, our organizations, and the field more broadly. Now, of course, I realize that I'm just saying this, and it's um, a pretty sort of general statement. How do we actually get that to happen? Well, I think in, in three ways. Communication, incentives, leadership. So if you think about communication, what does that look like? Um, it looks like pretty much what you would imagine, things like the Fail Festival. And it's not really an obscure concept. There was one in DC just last year, where people from different sectors come together to talk about things that didn't go according to plan. And this is really important because it normalizes the discussion around failure, around things that don't go as planned, which all of us have experienced, I'm sure. Another example of this is the failure report by uh, Engineers Without Borders Canada. This institution has an annual publication that details what didn't go according to plan and what have they learned from it. And so these channels are really critical for us to get this conversation started. Incentives, of course, donors. Donors have the, the power to decide what counts as a, a positive outcome of a project, what, what, what's a meaningful result. And it's really important that donors get on board with the fact that learning is a really important and critical element of a result of a project. Yes, maybe not all the boxes were ticked, but if we can learn, if we can derive uh, if we can improve the next step, if we can make every error an opportunity for improvement, that is a really valuable contribution, not just for that one single project that you happen to fund right there and then, but much broader uh, across the entire field. And of course, leadership. So all this learning thing, it's, you know, it's all very nice and well, um, but as long as, but we need people at the leadership of, at head of these organizations to make sure that learning is institutionally where it matters, that the organizations take it seriously and use it to improve over time. It's not just some, uh, you know, a buzzword that we can move on um, for the next conference, but it's actually something that is taken meaningfully within organizations and there are resources thrown at it um, so they can make it, make it count. And one field that I think is particularly, um, has particularly done well when it comes to this type of leadership is aviation. So you can see there in your graph, the bars are casualties, the, Trend line is number of passengers. And you can clearly see that as the number of passengers increased dramatically, the number of casualties has gone down. And the reason for this is because airlines realize that what's bad for one airline is bad for all airlines. They don't have to you know, um, hide their own uh, errors and mistakes. They share them so that everyone can improve. And if everyone does the same, then we can really make learning some sort of tie that raises all boats as it goes up. So thank you very much.